If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. We're going to run this for the first time. We've never done this in Mind Pump history where we've ran a MAPS anabolic 50% off sale for the entire The month. whole Yeah, month? we're running anabolic. Have we lost our minds? Lost our minds. Yes. Have we gone crazy? Absolutely. You know what? Here's the deal, though. I don't want to get charged up. Here's the deal. This is what we... That's the program that started it all. It was the yeah. first map. It's also the program that we, we all agree that just about everybody. There's always exceptions to the rule, so I say just about everybody. But just yeah, about if you don't want to get really fit or build muscle, then you should. <laughs> you know, yeah. just about everybody should start CrossFit. with this program. Mm -hmm. This should be the the foundation program. It was designed as our foundation program. So if you're just really getting into training, or you're just getting into actually following a really good program, excellent program to start with. Only three days a week too. So somebody <laughs> who can only commit to two or three days in the gym, this is the perfect Maps program. Anabolic is my go-to program for muscle building for guys and for metabolism uh, fixing or boosting for women. So when I get female clients who have damaged, quote-unquote, damaged metabolisms or slow metabolisms, 100% of the time, I put besides diet stuff and stuff like that I do with them, I put them on Maps Anabolic. Well, it's just so appropriate for like most gym-going people. That's it. Because, that's it. yeah, like typically they're going to be doing – like sets of three to 15 reps and you know and they're just gonna be working on hypertrophy constantly and that's it and taking them into the phase one is is like a shell shock that's it so in this episode of mind pump Ooh, a little different spin a little different so we uh, for the first 43 minutes we do our introductory conversation we talk about uh, oh i mentioned organifi i actually broke my fast with their green juice and i felt like i was uh on fire you hooked him up with a double commercial i today. did at the end a I double did. commercial I, I also, for organifi I also talked about the cocoa you're welcome whip. you double wrap if, if you listen to the end of the episode i talk about a cocoa whip uh recipe that i use organifi with we also talked about brew doctor they're our favorite uh kombucha beverage now, you can find them at most stores, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, New Seasons, Kroger's, the They Sprouts, got the can coming. And most Costco. They are. They're doing canned The can. Kombucha. Yeah. First ones to do this. Canned kombucha. Portable. July right. 9th, you should be able to find them in all your uh, Whole Foods around That's here. That's right. Now, for Organifi, we do have a discount. If you go to Organifi.com forward slash Mind Pump, enter the code Mind Pump, you get 20% off. Then we talk about my awesome new haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! It is uh, streamlined. It's, Supercuts paying off. It's, very, it's, thank you very much. All I know is it provides you, content for Adam. It's, very it's, short <laughs> and spunky. It's a spunky haircut. It's short. But it's it, fucked up. It's short. <laughs> it is. Adam it is. is. But you know what the best part is, Justin? Yes. It's there, though. I have hair. You know what? You know what <laughs> this is a massive point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you need to drive uh, home. Then uh, <laughs> Adam mentions mentions lugs and bugs what are those and today's kids what's wrong with these kids lugs nowadays and bugs. we talk about voyeurism uh oh. and uh my grandmother's surveillance system <laughs> <laughs> she's keeping an eye on the whole family it's yeah. awesome uh we talked it's about what giuseppe is doing eh? my my fast this weekend and then we had some debate over steroids and muscle memory. In Good other conversation words, here. If you mm. took steroids and then you stopped taking them, would you have the muscle memory from that muscle and would it benefit you later on? Great Dude, study. We should have remember. linked in the show notes. Yes. Then we get to the questions. The first question was, what is more important? Focus on minimum effective volume or maximum recovery, recoverable volume. Which one is what more is the important? difference? The next question was, how do you prevent or minimize overtraining if part of your profession includes lots of activity throughout the day, this particular person we know very well, she's a good friend of ours, she teaches people how to do the silks. She's climbing these things all day long. Mm -hmm. What can she do to minimize overtraining? Right. The next question was, if someone is in poor health mentally and physically, which one do you address first and why? Which one's or more important? are they intertwined? You gave it away, Justin. I did. Thank you. The final question Finally. was- Will missing breakfast affect your progress if you're if you're trying to gain muscle, or is it like a, is it all about just total food intake for the entire day? We also talk about the complete breakfast that we were sold back yeah. when we were kids. <laughs> Silly rabbit! At the end of every cereal commercial, Doug's a big fan of grape nuts. Apparently. You won't want to miss mm, that part of this episode. Yummy. And of course, we he just mentioned loves nuts all together. in the beginning <laughs> of this episode. <laughs> yeah. oh. He can fit two in his mouth. Oh, he's uh, just a nut lover. Just two at a time. Just bust them everywhere. In, uh, we, like wow. we mentioned at the beginning of this episode, MAPS Anabolic 
our foundational program, the program we've sold the most most of, most of the MAPS programs that people have gotten is MAPS Anabolic. It's that effective. We're cutting the price in half all month long. We've never done this before. We're likely to never do we this again. We may throw in some Gingsu knives. 50% off. We also have bundles of MAPS programs. This is where we take multiple MAPS programs, put them together for specific goals. For example, we have a sexy athlete bundle. We have a build your butt bundle. We have a super bundle, which is year of exercise programming. All of these are available at mindpumpmedia.com. T-shirt time! And it's T-shirt time. Oh, boy. It's the T-shirt time. It's the T-shirt time. Let's all do the T-shirt time. Go! All right. 31 <laughs> reviews. It's a new jingle I'm working on. 31? 31 reviews. And we're giving wow. out nine shirts. So the winners are Boise Kid, Nice App, Brandy mm. Chaos. <laughs> you almost got me. <laughs> Jay Smiles, 24. Mm. Trevor Offman, Yo Mama, 3223. My mom? What happened? Why you got to bring my mama She in got this? it? D Dang, Use Your Noodle, 23, and Shithead Steve. <laughs> <laughs> the all pump heads. Wow. All of you are winners. Send a name I just read <laughs> to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Send your shirt size, your shipping address, and we'll get that right out to you. Use your noodle. Hey, you know what? Yeah. What? You get your haircut this weekend. I see it's a little short, Ooh. bro. Come this is what, this is is what like happens when you, this is what happens when you go to super you know, cuts, bro. I've been you know like, no. <laughs> hey, you know, uh, you know why I hate yeah, you? They went too far. You know why I hate you? <laughs> because you because you jumped the gun. <laughs> I was gonna make fun of myself, you fuck, uh, dude. So I go in there. And here, hey, here's <laughs> you here's you even I was waiting to get on the mic. As soon as I saw him, right like, away. see now, listen, yeah. this is why because I I've been through this. I know it's like this is what happens when you get your hair cut, super cuts, yeah, and you never know who you're gonna get, and you don't get the same lady you normally get, or. Whatever. This lady got the heavy hand, and they go Bro, a this old. Too, they go a little too yeah. short. It was this 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 old like, like old. Oh, calm down. It was this old Vietnamese lady, very old, and she's like, "Oh, how would you like your hair?" And I, I know the numbers. I'm like this, that, and the other. And she's, like, oh, "Oh, what about the top? Is this too short?" I'm like, "Well, <laughs> yes, it is. Well, we're going for but that. But that's the way we're going to go now." <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The way I look at it is. You know, I spend twenty dollars on a haircut, right? If I add up, it's probably like one out of every <laughs> it's, one out of every ten haircuts. Is I, not happy with. Yeah. No, I'm not happy with. Yeah. But it grows back. You know what I mean? Yeah. I have hair. That reminds me of back. when they left like a patch around the cowlick. You know, like the back. Like they had. I literally almost had a yamaka. Yeah, Dude. like the guy just left this patch of hair. So right I there. come home and I'm looking in the mirror. I'm like, this. Bitch, she gave me a fucking jujitsu haircut. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's how I used to cut my hair when I used to compete. Right. So I get super, home and super tight. And Jessica's like, it doesn't look that bad because I got on the phone with her. I'm like, this fucking lady, man, this old ass lady. <laughs> she's like, it's not that bad. I'm like, well, you know. And I started. I was looking uh, in the mirror and I was cracking up so hard. And she's like, why are you laughing? I'm like, I guarantee you. Yeah, Adam's going to say yeah. some shit. I guarantee you Adam's going to say something because I always talk about like spending a lot of money on haircuts. Who cares? I'm like, oh, you, you, know, you know how hard it was yeah, for me not cares? to say something when he first walked out of the studio? I was like, oh, wow. oh this motherfucker fucked his haircut up and I'm not going to say anything until we get on the podcast. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> I barely Hello. even noticed, dude. So there you go. Yeah, because you, yeah. you don't notice that kind of stuff. No. Yeah, yeah. Adam yeah. notices. Yeah, Adam, does. <laughs> right Adam, Adam definitely does. Which is like, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. I don't you know. know. What I mean? Yeah. He's no, always- I remember. I remember that man. I, that was the that was the one drawback of the nine dollar haircut. Is it, you're exactly right. One out of ten. Wait, wait, wait. Nine dollars? Well, that's what it was back in the day. Oh, I was gonna yeah. say, where's yeah. this place? Yeah, where's yeah. that? Fuck. <laughs> well, back on that. I'm going over there. I mean, I, well, I used to get for a long time. I had a nine dollar haircut at least until probably twenty five. I would say. I think yeah. the twenty five. I think around the twenty five range was when mm. I decided to pony up. Well, so the, the, the place that I go, I know the people there, the regulars or whatever, <laughs> and there's one lady. It's the old Vietnamese lady. She cannot. I will not let her cut my hair because this is the second time she's cut it, and every time she does it, she's a little. Yeah. She gets a little overzealous. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. She gets excited. Well, it's tough, dude, because like these salons, even like that, are really expensive. They don't know how to cut like men's hair the way I want it yeah. cut. Yeah. Well, you know, it's men, like, men's hair is tough. It is tough. Yeah, any stylist will tell you that cutting a man's hair is much harder than it because there's less is room. It? Yeah. Oh yeah. Way less room for air. That's why. Yeah, it's really fine. When you like, when you're when you're dealing with a, it's just like an artist, right? That that's sculpting something. Like as you get to a smaller of a piece, it gets more def. It's more technical and it's why hard. is it so much more expensive to cut a woman's hair? More work. 
Yeah. Uh, There's more work yeah, involved. Probably, too, because the market... Do a does, bunch of stuff. Probably because yeah. women yeah. are willing hey, to pay more. Exactly. Probably. Color it and all yeah, this stuff. That's, the, that's, the, that's what it is. It's that there's most guys are like me yeah. who are like, eh, whatever. <laughs> it's a little short, but it's <laughs> fine. I don't give a shit. No. Like, we literally take it. Just, I used to just, like, buzz my hair oh, just do you know because how, it was easier. Do you know how happy that makes me to yeah. do that? Yeah. Because yeah. I, sh- I, I used to buzz my whole head. I did that for a while while I was doing... Uh, when I was training jiu-jitsu. Yeah. And... It's, it's the ultimate athletic haircut. Oh, bro, it just feels so good. Yeah, you know what I mean. We're I'm the about only problem is I kind of looked like a white nationalist. <laughs> yeah, you know, like that a, was the only problem. like a white supremacist. Yeah, yeah. 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 See, I can do it. I, I had to explain right away. I'm like, no, to that right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> that's, why, that's why I still have hair. I'm like, I don't, I'm not, I don't subscribe. Well, so I'm I'm like one or two years away in my relationship with Jessica where I'm going to just start buzzing my hair. Like I still, like I got to look good still, but a year or two later, <laughs> yeah. in a year or two, I'm going to start bzz, all of it. I'm like, sorry, this is the way I'm going to do it. <laughs> no, I can't. I got to be on YouTube. Yeah. yeah what are you going to do? I think you look good with a shaved head. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, I, I, I don't. I would love to go you back don't? to shaved no, head. You don't? No, I don't look well, good. I, do you have I have like, a nice shaved head. you have like divots or something in your head? No. Or my workouts go up like uh, like at least like 30%. Oh, I just, yeah. I feel more testosterone. Yeah, just, yeah, I don't believe the story of Samson at all. I think it was the opposite. No, it's totally opposite. I think he grew his hair and got that was a story story made up by women. Yeah. Do you know why? Yeah. And if you think Keep about it, if you think about it, like historically speaking, I was thinking about this as this woman was butchering my my hair. I was like, you know, because this is what I do when I'm in an uncomfortable place. I start to get philosophical. It takes me away from what's going on because I was getting irritated. <laughs> yeah. But I knew if I said something, she'd get worse. So I'm like, just fucking keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. I'm like, I wonder why in most cultures men have had short hair. And women have had longer hair. Mm. Why was that a thing? And it's obvious, right? It's obvious why men have always cut their hair short. Because we're we, we in battle, when you're fighting with someone else, you don't want to give somebody... <laughs> yeah, you don't want to get your hair pulled. No. no. Have you seen girls fight? Oh, yeah. That's, That's the, the first, first thing. If let me, let me tell you something. Yeah. You guys ever watch... Did you guys watch the early UFCs? Mm-hmm. Dude, I saw such a good girl do you, fight. Do, oh, hold on, tell uh, me in a second. Uh, do you guys yeah. do you guys remember part uh, UFC three when Hoist Gracie fought Chemo, that big old jacked, roided out Hawaiian looking dude with the big cross tattoo on his back? I remember that. I remember both yeah, really long hair. I can't remember so, the fight. So Hoist at the time was everybody thought he was like, oh my god, he's like, he's a god. He's killing everybody. He can't, you know, he can't lose. Then this big dude. Kimo, who outweighed him by like 80 pounds with this big muscular strong dude, fights him and gets on top of him. And like is the first time Hoist looked like, oh my God, you gotta watch out. So Hoist just grabs a hold of this guy's Hair. big ass ponytail and just has a grip and he keeps that to control Kimo and he ends up winning the fight eventually. And uh that's just it. Like you you if you have long hair. That's a, that's a, I mean, if I fought a dude with long hair, I well, would grab his hair. Well, they, of course they, they made that rule in football. Yeah, we did that in football. That, we, in football, it's your hair's football. part of the jersey, man. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. Oh, yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah. So if you're a running back and you think it's cool to have long ass dreads and shit hanging out your <laughs> fucking helmet, and there's I mean, dudes I that to like say, go, but I did it. Go, oh, yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, if, if they just ba- like turn the corner and, and all you have is either, you know, like their the back of their jersey or like hair, I'm like grabbing your fucking hair. Pulling you down, <laughs> pulling you down. Yeah, yeah. I love it. So you it's said the you move. Saw, you said you saw a really good girl. Oh, girl when fight. I was in uh, th- the best girl fight I've ever seen. I've seen a lot of girl fights my entire life, but the best one I ever saw was in in high school. Man, this girl and these two girls, both of them were just. They rarely ever do you see two girls that like are like ready to down to throw, and these girls were both ready to throw, and they came at each other, and the first thing. You grab grab each other's hair, and one girl just got a better grip on both sides, like like ponytail sides, you know, and grabs a hold of her and sh- knead her right in the <laughs> face, dude. Split her face wide open, blood uh, everywhere. She got her in a Muay Thai. Oh clinch. man! Just they, and then when they when they pulled them apart, they the girl, had a handful they, of hair. Oh, girls! Both the girls had handful of hair, and they're uh, like, "Oh my oh, god, man. dude! That yeah, got that's, hurt pulling that." That's shit the already. first place you're gonna go, man. That's why we cut <laughs> yeah, our get hair. Rid of it. Speaking of high school, so I'm 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 reading the uh, the iGen book, right? And they're talking about like the generation coming up. So this is like a lot of the high schoolers right now. And one of the things like sexuality and stuff like that. And we've kind of grazed on or talked about this a little Mm -hmm. bit, like as Mm -hmm. far as how that's changing and different and kids are having sex later. And a lot of them are not, you know, there's this new trend of like to not identify with one one sex or the other and so they have (laughs) they have new terms and new things that they're doing so fluidity thing well so there's this 
there's a thing called lug and bugs. Lugs and bugs. Oh L U G and B U G. Lug stands for lesbian until graduation, and bug stands for bisexual until graduation. And so there's this trend that's going on right now that it's like high school and like early twenties are the, is the time to like experiment with both boys and girls to kind of figure out like oh my God. what you're supposed to be with later on. And they actually have terms yeah. for them. You know what's funny about this? I didn't know Is this. that they just named Logs something. and bugs. They just named something that happens, that used to happen too. It always happens. This has always happened. Right. People have had, the first sexual experiences tend to be with the same sex. Not full on sex, but the first sexual experience. Because those are the people you hang around, hang around with the most. They're just now labeling it. Well, color. and the generation now too is also trying not to get like attached in relationships. Like yeah, there's, that there's, one I've that one I've read about. Yes, that that one's a little worrisome. I meant to tell you, I forgot to. Okay, I got her. I'll share the chapter over you, but it completely debunked the idea that the this generation now is into more open relation relationships and promiscuity. Is it promiscuity? Yeah, promiscuity. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Are they into the opposite? Yeah. So oh, wow. waiting, it's like less of them are having sex at an earlier age. Most of them are waiting till longer, and most of them actually desire. So it's more a, millennial, like the the generation. It's not even. It's, yeah, well, they were more, and we were even more than yeah, that. We were more than and that. then it gives even further when you get into like the seventies, seventies, and stuff. So mm. it was. It's not happening that way now. It looks like that, mm-hmm. and because some of the things that they're saying, how none of them really want like a. What they don't want is a for sure relationship in in high school or college because. At that time, they they know their brain is still developing. They're still trying to take care of themselves, and getting in a relationship could compromise that. Mm. And so there is they're more likely not to date or be in a relationship at all. But it's not promoting more sex or with with multiple partners. So they they read all the stats on all that, yeah. and there's like less. They're having less sex. They're having less sex with multiple partners. Like, and most of them say too that they would desire a relationship. It's just they're not looking for that right now at this at this point. In that's their life. interesting. Mm-hmm. Dude. I wonder if that's just a byproduct of the like the over parenting or the you know like you have the drawbacks of that and then maybe some positives too where mm-hmm. maybe kids are less likely to. So that's they theorize that it's that a little bit is on uh, the parents of the generation that's raising the kids right now, the helicopter parents yeah. and, and being like it's very normal. And you know, now that I've read this and I've gone back and kind of thought about like all these kids that I'm meeting that are in the 17 to 20 20 year olds, many of them like bring their parents all to places. Here's a crazy thing for you, and I believe uh, I Katrina was just talking to dorky. was just talking to our intern Enzo about this. Is I don't know about you guys, but Friday Friday night for football games for me was like a like in high school was a big deal. I mean, we roped off a whole area. Everybody did pre drinking before they went to the game. It was like an event. Like mm-hmm. yeah. you got smashed and acted like a fool all day at the or at the Friday night game, and then after the game you go to the after party and you're hanging out all night long and doing whatever. Well, n- kids now to go home after the game, and they, a lot of them go to the game with their parents. Huh. So it's really common if you're in high school now to go watch a football game with parents. It's just it's not it's not weird. It's normal. Like you love your parents. Your parents are cool. You're watching the high school football game, and then you go. It's home. like a mixed bag. Parents are cool. Yeah. yeah. No, I think it's it's like a mixed bag. I think you know the other part of it too is I know parents are having less kids. So like the average family today has less kids than the average family did, let's say, 30 years ago. Yeah. And that may contribute to more. Parenting, right? You know what I mean? Because they're around more, and they're gonna like focus it seems on you a more. good, but it also seems a little needy on the parents' part. Like you know, let them like have friends and do things by themselves. Yeah, yeah I don't know. It's yeah, a, I don't know. It's just kind of weird. It's like cool because you can have that kind of relationship, but at the same time, it's like you know, let's uh, let's let them develop uh, other relationships. Well, so the, I mean, you, it's you a, know, one of the things that they they have uh, correlated this with that I thought was really fascinating that I thought you guys would get a kick out of was. Uh, 16 and pregnant. The decline. Oh, I read uh, this. I read this dude, somewhere else. This, it was that like, did great things, actually. It right? did. Yeah. This, this statistic yeah. on like underage pregnancy and so, or uh, pre- pregnancy out of wedlock or under the age of like 18 or something. I can't remember what the, the, the actual statistic said, but man, it's like dec- decreased by like yeah. 20%. Yep. And yeah. since that show went live on, on TV, and they did all these interviews with a lot of students, and a lot of them referenced that show. Like oh I don't I don't want to be like a- <laughs> I've seen what that looks like <laughs> yeah so I thought that was kind of fascinating 
Oh know? yeah, it's good that they show all that and like all the steps and they're like how crazy it is the environment and it just takes over your entire life. Like like kids. Just well, we always don't we, even realize. We that. always tease me right and we joke about that. I watch that when I'm sick right and I always yeah. say like I, <laughs> I'm always trying. <laughs> I'm always trying to connect like why is that or whatever. And the only thing that I could come up with is that it make because I feel so miserable at the moment like physically that it makes me feel better about myself seeing that going like I'm so glad I didn't have a kid. It's, <laughs> it's like watching hoarders. Right. It's, it's something like that. You don't say yeah. so. I'm, if, I'm sure that's what's happened to a lot of these 16, 17, 18 year old kids that are watching the show too are just yeah. like, I don't want to be anything but that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I don't want to end up stuck well, at home with my mom forever. Crazy, dude. Uh, this this kid, I didn't know him. And, I, you know, so that's why I don't really want to like uh, talk too much about like who exactly he is. But uh, in local news, there's this kid that like grew up at our high school. And like a lot of my friends were really good friends with him and like super, st- like, clean kid like uh everybody had like nothing but positive things to say about him but found out that um one of the local uh coffee shops had caught him on camera um basically embedding a, a little tiny camera inside to videotape everything in the restroom went into the bathroom in the bathroom in the bathroom Oh, shit. And, like, you know who goes in there? Everybody. You know, like, men, women, kids, everybody. And so they they got a warrant for his arrest and went to his house and, like, found all that shit and all the videos. Oh, my God. At his place. So I was just like. And this was a kid that you, and, that was known to be, yeah, like, Yeah, nice- like, exactly. And everybody had nothing but, like, man, it was, like, super stand-up kid, like, good kid. And So they actually saw him on surveillance putting it there. Yeah. How old is this kid? He's a couple years younger than me, so he's like uh, my my friend's brother was good friends with him, so he's he's like maybe like two three years. Wait uh, a minute, and this is now. Mm-hmm. So he's not a kid. Like he's over a, the weekend. He's yeah, a grown he's ass a kid. adult. He's, a, he's an adult. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I, I consider him younger than me a kid. I always say that. I don't yeah, know. you're <laughs> saying this, this good kid. I'm thinking like this some 13 year old kid. No, no, he's no. a fucking pervert. He's, he's an old a fucking man. Perv, dude. Wow. Ah, oh, and I couldn't believe. It. And then I I remembered. Have you ever watched that Netflix documentary Voyeur? No. So it was about this owner of a motel that he purchased that um, I guess like he actually built in a way that he could go behind all the rooms, climb up into the top and like look down through the the ventilation, like, uh, you know, part Mm -hmm. of where like the air comes in and watch people have sex and and all that kind of stuff. Got away with it for like over two decades. And then two decades, two decades, and then then Holy decided shit. to come out later and tell this re- reporter from like the New Yorker, or I guess he's real famous for like like interviewing people that have like really interesting fetishes and stuff, and just came out and like did this whole like Netflix documentary with him. It was like it was super fucking creepy and like very fascinating all at the same time. Like he had this like weird impression like one day like I guess where he was outside and he saw like this neighbor lady like like taking her shirt off or whatever and, and then that just became this obsession like he just started obsessing obsessing about it and uh th- it they carried with him into you know creating this entire environment to suit his like fucked up you know desires. I think we're gonna see more of this well because the cameras are so easy to and, I, and, and for a lot of reasons porn too I, right a like, lot of reasons yeah a lot of reasons i mean i think that we're we're becoming less socially connected to each other where we actually go and interact and talk to people and go look at naked people in real life you know what i'm saying it's like you're so well there's cameras everywhere you know what my grandma showed me this today yesterday mm-hmm. so we were at my mom's house for dinner right and my grandma who is 75 years old you know old school sicilian woman and she cracks me up because she's Somehow she's like up and up with technology sometimes. Like she'll be on Facebook and she doesn't have a driver's license, never driven her entire life. <laughs> Old school, right? So she brings me her cell phone and she goes, oh, look, Salvatore, look what I have. And I look at it and I'm like, that's, uh, that's your house. And she goes, yeah, I got the camera hooked up to the phone. And she goes, and look at this. And she switches cameras and she's like, look, this is your aunt's house. I'm like, you're looking at her house too? She, they have the Nest cameras. <laughs> they have the Nest cameras hooked up. Yeah. And then the, she's on the fucking network and yeah. she can watch everybody's house. Yeah. So my grand this is by the way, by the way, this is a this is a Sicilian grandmother's dream, right? Oh, she can of watch. Course. Yeah, yeah. So she's on her phone and she's toggling between Mama's the, always watching. The, yeah, the different cameras. 
And she's like, this morning I see, yeah. the, you know, Casey walk out. This is my, my, my <laughs> aunt's, you know, husband. Casey walk outside and he fixed it the garage. And she goes, look, I can see. She she rewinds the video, shows me what he's <laughs> fixing the garage. I'm like, are you at home watching everybody? Like, what are you everybody? doing? <laughs> she's like, you should get one it's to your like house. It's TV. It's so great. She's like, then I can watch if your kids are, you know, whatever. And I'm like, I'm thinking about it. I'm like, that's not a bad idea, you know? Yeah. If, I, if I let my grandma yeah, watch you, that shit, I'll be- you think about last week when Jessica was cooking in the kitchen naked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Us walking outside in the backyard, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I was I was cracking up because and these cameras are like oh they're sophisticated oh dude and, and you, you watch you, it you get really small ones and get a lot where you get an alert on your phone so her phone will give her an alert when there's motion oh, yeah. uh huh so and then you can talk through the camera oh wow so she said that somebody came to my aunt's house and rang the doorbell nobody's home so she talked to the camera who is it you know <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm here to whatever. Okay, we'll get it later or whatever, and yeah. they leave. I was cracking up, but yeah, that's gonna, dude. If I if I ever yeah. saw if I ever caught a guy doing that, I mean, for me, I don't give a shit. You can record me all you want. You're yeah. the one. You're the one that's gonna be embarrassed. Trust me, I'm not gonna yeah. give a shit. But if I catch that shit with my kids around, Are you kidding me? You're dude? gonna get it. You're Are gonna get the beating me? of a lifetime. That's the thing, dude. Like, yeah. I, I, like, it's so fucked up and perverted. Like, where where did that like enter his head that that was a good idea? You know, like how how did that fucking happen? You know, like I, I've just been like. It, it's seriously like it's, it's been, becoming di- disconnected from people, dude. Yeah. It's not reality to I them. I can't even like it's imagine. Not re- it's not reality. It's TV in well, a sense. People it's back movies. in the, at least back in the day without cameras, you had to like hide. You know what I mean? You had to like be there. Mm-hmm. Do you ever read the story about the guy? This is a. I think it's a true story. Hopefully, Doug can confirm this because I don't want to be making up some shit. But I think it's a true story. There was a guy that was arrested because he crawled into a porta potty and laid at the bottom. Ew. So he can watch oh. people go to the bathroom. Oh, that's disgusting. Oh. That can't be real. I mean, that's I'm, commitment. I'm yeah. almost, <laughs> like at least he exactly. was in there. Yeah. I'd be still be mad. You'd still yeah. get a beating, yeah, but at yeah. least I'd be like, well, like, hold on, I'm not yeah. done. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah you're disgusting. You guys, yeah. that can't be real. Yeah. <laughs> that can't be real. I, I'm almost positive that was a true story. We got to look that up. Maybe Doug can Just find this the gross Yeah, thing look, ever heard, dude. hidden tank of portable portable toilet to spy on women. He was sentenced to three years in prison. Oh my Why? god! Why? Just leave him in the porta potty. Oh yeah. God. Just have ju- say, just have just Justin. Leave him, just leave him there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Like <laughs> eat a whole thing at like Taco right. Bell. You know, and we're like, not gonna put you in prison. Burritos. We're gonna leave you there for yeah. two weeks, like, bro. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make going. you pay for this, you son of a bitch. Get all get all your sick thrills out. Come out, yeah. Shit on. Come out of the bathroom. We'll go up to Justin. Hey, Justin, we got a situation. Listen, there's a guy hiding in there trying to look at people. Blast them out. I need to go in there and uh, paint some toilets. <laughs> Get their paint some- the fucking dude would die. What a crazy it was at dude. a yoga festival. <laughs> oh my god, it's a yoga festival. <laughs> I don't know why. That's you, so funny. That's a lot of vegans. That's a lot that's of a, you know what? That, that's, that's a lot of bad. That's poop. a smart that's strategy. Stringy. You think so? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know, man. You're not gonna go to a barbecue. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh my god, you're right. <laughs> a bunch of people. Oh, horrible, yeah, dude. Yeah. They go there. The vegan idea. That's a vote yoga. There's probably a lot bunch of vegans, bunch of salad eaters. Where they <laughs> like, yeah. Little tiny. Any poops, little pellets hitting yeah, him, yeah. yeah dude, he ain't tripping. Not a lot of fiber, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fiber coming out. That's disgusting. That's terrible. What's wrong with people? Ew. Yeah, God, I did. People are fucked uh, up. Speaking of diets, I, I just did my my monthly fast. Uh, just did it this weekend. All right. You know what always surprises me? So each month I've done it now for this has got to be month. You're like five or six at least. I think it's month six. Each time I do it, I get better and better and better after each time. I can physically Now I was feel really curious happening. about how you felt this time because you you've been increasing like me and Justin too, increasing our carb intake and I know my appetite is starting to Oh, really my appetite roll. was way high. Yeah. It was much more difficult. So yeah. was this for the hardest one? Much more difficult uh, okay. for with food. I mean, it's still like, you know, I'll do it, but definitely this time I wanted to eat more than I have in the past. If I go into a fast already low calories or keto, then my appetite's usually not that bad. But this time I went in there with my metabolism's amped up. I've been eating more. I definitely wanted more food, but I did it. I did, uh, uh, how long did we go? Almost 40 hours. So I didn't even do a full 48 hours. Oh, wow. You didn't go a full 48 hours. No, I, you know, I listen to my body. You know, I, I, I feel like if, if, if my gut is off, then I'll go longer. If I go into it good, then I'll go shorter. I don't think a super long one is not only necessary but benefit. You have to listen to your body at the end of the day. And it just felt right to end it at that particular time. And what I love about it is n- not only do I improve after each time, so after each time I notice less inflammation, better reactions to food. I'm at the point now where I'm eating sourdough bread sometimes, no reaction whatsoever. And then sourdough bread is, is less gluten than regular mm-hmm. bread because mm-hmm. it's fermented. But still, I couldn't even do that before, right? I'm able to eat starches, no problem. I actually had pasta at my mom's house. Wow. No issues. 
Um, but one thing that I that it's also the the thing that you eat right after you break a fast, you can feel what's going on. So I had uh, uh, a little of the Organifi green juice to break my fast, just a little bit of it, mm-hmm. drank it. Mm-hmm. Boy, that was like a whole nother supplement. Zing! Mm. I felt it right away. Boo! Energy really? and yeah, right away. Like I must have assimilated the shit out of it right away. What's your th- What's your thoughts about doing like kombucha right afterwards? Like using like our brew doctor and drinking that right after you get out of a fast? Uh, so what I, I do typically will aim for, so I like the green juice. I like the way that felt. So I might start using that more often. I like bone broth, liquid things, right? Liquid yeah. calories that are kind of easy. Um, and then I do do, uh, I typically will do either kombucha or uh, I make sure to take a probiotic just to get, because your, your, your gut microbiome is different when you're not eating because you haven't been feeding it. Right, right. And what you may notice after a fast, I haven't communicated this well enough in the past, so I want to I want to make sure people know this. When you break a fast, how you break the fast is very important. And expect your gut to be a little off. Oh, totally. That w- the day you break the fast, very much so. Everybody yeah. that everybody that I know that's pushed a, a two day or beyond yeah. fast, like you just you're super sensitive. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you it's like your your gut almost it goes asleep in in essence. So kind of like it almost like it hibernates. It stops doing anything, and then when you throw food in it, it wakes it up. And the first thing it does is it tries to evacuate. You know, kind of what was in there. Yeah. So the first like one to three, you know bathroom trips that you have are not ideal. They're not I haven't even ideal. thought about trying the, the brew doctor until right now, until you're talking right now. I thought, oh, maybe that's a good idea. Because every time I've done, I've done like a, a broth. I've mm-hmm. done like either a bone broth or a chicken broth, like heading into it and then like just a small bowl of vegetables and then like a, just a small portion of meat. And then it takes me a, about the second or third day before I Your really- Your gut's back to normal. Yeah, before I feel like my stomach feels really good. It's the second and third day. Sorry, let me think. Yesterday was the- First, second. So today's like the second day, second, maybe two and a half, mm-hmm. is when I start to feel the rebound and I, dare I say anabolic effect from it. And I say dare I say because I'm going to, I'm sure I'm going to get some people who are going to uh, get angry with me for saying that. But for sure, I notice personally <clears throat> the second or third day, it's like I feed my body and if, it's like the post diet rebound that you get you know when you mm-hmm. come off of a show or whatever yeah where you just feel like your muscles soak everything up yeah and my workouts start to feel really good i, far, I start to feel really strong so uh I, that's so it takes about two or three days but the day after my gut's still a little off yeah, you yeah. know what i mean so. i'm excited though dude brew doctor's got their their can now now you can take your uh your your stuff all over to the beach now no more uh having because you can't drink no beer ever you never drink mm-hmm. any beer now you can drink your kombucha are there any the other god they have no a, nobody's got no. a can dude they're the first ones why to do it. The first ones to do it. I know. That's weird. Why are they the first ones? I don't know. I don't know Is why. Is any- something with the kombucha? I, I mean, Doug would have a better guess at something like that. Yeah. We already, they sent them over to us. Like, I, I don't know if you drank one yet out of the can. It's freaking awesome. Dude, they, they have the best taste in kombucha. I, yeah, yeah, I haven't had it out of the can yet. I'm excited. Dude. Yeah, Especially it, to bring it with you and stuff like that. They sent over a portable. case for us. So we, they, July 9th. So this, what, this goes live, what, a couple days before that. So, you know. July 9th is when it'll be in Whole Foods. So everyone that hasn't mm-hmm. tried it out or wants to try it out, I think that's cool right before summertime. And not everybody's drinking beer on the beach all the time. They give you a little alternative, a yeah. little mm-hmm. healthy alternative. Mm-hmm. That's that's It's the best tasting kombucha that I've had. I've definitely made the switch to, to that one. So I, I read an interesting article um, in sciencemag.org the other day. The title of it is Hundreds of New Genes – may underlie intelligence. So identified a, a bunch of new genes that they think are connected to intelligence that are also connected to autism and depression. Mm. So we've, we've, we've now suspected for a while that high levels of, of intelligence are somehow connected to higher rates of depression, anxiety. Seem a little more tormented. And autism. I don't know. I think what it is is I was reading about like what, what, why the theory of this exists. Whenever you have a species, the what's the most of or what you see the, the, the highest percentage of that species, like in the middle, like if we look at humans, we're an intelligent species, right? The middle, the middle pack is where you're going to be the safest. That's where you're going to see probably the longest potential for lifespan, the best ability to fight off, general fight off disease, you know, a general level of intelligence, all that stuff. The outliers are, are different. They're different. So if you're, by nature, if you're very, very intelligent compared to everybody else, by nature, you're different. You're, you just have something different about you. So it's almost like your genes played a little bit of a 
craps. Like they threw the dice mm. and boom, you got the genes that make you far more intelligent, but you've also taken a risk mm-hmm. with these other genes right. that might cause other Tip problems. Tip you over into depression. That's part of it. And then there's some other theories that say that just very intelligent people are uh, more neurotic. Like there's more stuff to think about right. and that might cause more you know, anxiety. Like they stuff. overthink things. Yeah. Or, yeah, they feel like personally responsible to you know do something as they know you know certain like ways to to handle certain problems and so they like carry a lot of weight yeah, or maybe they just know the the potential risks and and stuff like that right what's the old saying ignorance is bliss yeah i think that may be true to to some to some extent so. I, I wanted to talk I to you about that. the epigenetic modification study that you sent over to me the other day i think that's super yeah, fast I didn't remember, did which one? I don't remember reading it. Yeah, that's the one on if you have taken steroids before. Oh, yeah. If you've mo- so basically, if you've modified your genetics, that it well, may this- potentially actually modify your DNA forever. Well, this is the that's one. This is the study that showed that it was it was based off the study that showed that when people guys lifted weights for seven weeks, then didn't lift weights at all for seven weeks, and then they'd work out again. That not only would they gain their gains back very quickly, but that they they gain more. Mm-hmm. Now, now here's the other side of that, I, and I think the percentages were like 12 percent over what they had initially gained. So there was like a, a not only did they gain back what they got, but they got extra. My question for that is, would they have gotten that and then some if they'd never taken that time off? Mm-hmm. In other words, is it making up for what they missed, or is it more than what they missed, or is it less than what they missed? But what they talked about in this article was that because of muscle memory, let's say you go on a bunch of anabolic steroids, you know, and you, you build all this. Let's say you gain 25 pounds over your genetic potential, right? Let's say your genetic potential says that you can only gain, you know, get up to 200 pounds lean. Of well, lean this, body is, mass. this is probably one of the most popular questions that I've been asked by young kids that are growing up that are considering taking steroids is one of the most common questions asked is, will I lose all my gains after I get off? And do I have to run them all the time in order to get bigger? Is that and so and that's always been something that I I can't answer. Like I don't know the answer. I have my own personal experience and what I think, but I have not seen anything that's come out to show this. And this is the first study that may prove that if once you've ran anabolic steroids, that you now have a higher potential to build more muscle. There's a lot of forever, even when you're off. Yeah, and there's a lot of factors, right? But let's say, like you again, like you you let's say your limit, your genetic limit for muscle gain with good training, good diet, all that stuff is 200 pounds. Then you throw anabolics on it and you push your body to 215, so you gain 15 more pounds of of muscle. Then you go off the steroids, everything goes back to normal. Does that muscle memory from the extra 15 pounds still apply to where now you're able to gain a little bit more muscle? I, I think yes. I think that there may be a little extra that you get from that. But here's the other factor, though. I, a, I think you have to stay on them for a little while and keep that muscle for a little while. Mm-hmm. And B, there's a lot of other factors like, okay, now you've been on steroids for a little while. Now you go off. Are your hormones going to ever go back to normal? Are right. you ever going to have the same... You know, are you going to understand your body and training like you would have? That's a big factor because I know a lot of guys that ran a lot of, you know, uh, gear for years who when they went off, even with normal testosterone levels, they don't know how to fucking train because they never really learned right. how their body reacted. and re- So there's all these factors, you know what I mean, that, mm-hmm. that, that go into that. But I think all, all, all things being equal... I think so. I think there's probably an advantage. Well, I, I really wanted to discuss this with you. I just think it was so crazy that you had sent this over first. And this has been kind of like something that I'm paying attention to with myself right now. So I find this really fascinating right now. I'm barely like getting back to what I, you know, I I'm not even my normal good self. But I mean, the fact that I'm already in the quote unquote normal range of mm-hmm. Uh, free testosterone is a huge plus for me, and I can already feel it. Like, you know, and, and since we've reintroduced carbohydrates, my training's going great. I've got go- good momentum right now, and the gains are coming on strong, like stronger than I really, really anticipated. Like, I went from like being depressed and almost frustrated because I wasn't seeing any progress to now that I feel like my hormones and everything's back into place. Carbohydrates are now kicked back up. Like, I am just I'm putting mass on like really fast. Mm. And the weight that I'm carrying myself, I've never been in this weight without testosterone. I've always had to, to be I'm 220 now. Mm. So I'm I'm this is the weight that I am when I'm when I'm taking anabolics. Now, I'm not my competitive 5% body fat sure. 220 right now, so I'm definitely softer than what I would normally. But even to put be able to put that kind of mass on 
at that that ease. For, I mean, that was but in the past to get to a weight of 220 pounds for me was like stuffing myself. Mm-hmm. Was constantly carrying my meals yeah. everywhere around, and I'm eating three meals a day right now. Three meals a day for me is, and now I, I'm coming from eating one meal and almost two meal a day, but only three meals and maybe a shake in there on like a really high like high volume day or a day where I'm. I moving. think it might play a role. I think there's, because I'm trying to think of like. Now, I was on testosterone for four years consistently, yeah. you know, four or five years consistently, so I definitely think that my body had become adapted to. Well, that do news. you think that higher levels of testosterone, or at least the high levels that you were on, or or you know when you're taking gear. Do you think that contributes to muscle hyper, hyperplasia? Yeah. I think yeah. I was just so I think it, muscle hyperplasia. It's probably a combination of the two, yeah, right? Because that doesn't yeah. go away, right? I don't yeah. think if you if you gain new muscle fibers, they shrink and grow, but I don't think they go away, right? And I think too, like the steroids might help to contribute you to to you know op, like get to a place where you, your capacity stretches even further than like what you normally were capable of, which creates that muscle hyperplasia to where that's like mm-hmm. sort of a new standard that your body has to deal with. Now yeah. here's the question I have, right? Let's. Here's the the question. So we'll use you as an example again, Adam, and uh, you know you can give us your opinion. So you're how old are you? Thirty six, thirty seven, thirty six, thirty six, right? So let's say instead of the doing, you know, being on gear ever, let's say you never did gear, you right. never did it when you were younger, right? And then you never did it the last four or five years, right? But you still train consistently, you still ate consistently, all that stuff. Do you think you would have reached this point like you're at now, where you can feel this? Do you think you would be better? Or do you think you'd be worse? Because you have to count all the shit that you've gone through right. with it. The fact that you sh- you know you're, you've had to deal with your hormones. Well, so I don't think that I I could have built as much muscle as I I built in where I'm at now. I I believe that that's given me an advantage because I because I have ran multiple cycles. So I definitely think that on that end, it's given me an advantage. Now, the great disadvantage and where I would caution anybody even considering it is. I don't think there's a lot of human beings that could could have dealt with what I just dealt with for like the last eight eight months and like it not fucking just ruin life for them. I mean that was a really really tough space to be in mm-hmm. uh, for that long of a period of time. And I'm still not a hundred percent out of it. I'm like I'm coming out of it really, and I feel really good right now. So I have a lot of positive things to say. But, but you're also a trainer. You're also like a, a student of the game, right? So I, and aware of what's going on with me. Like the average person who's you know fucking around with anabolics and they take. I, yeah, I think the average person went through what you went through. It would have put him in a worse position. Hundred percent less mm-hmm. muscle, less everything. Hundred percent. Right. Yeah. So I think I think I I was fully aware of what was going on with my body, what I did to it, how I needed to come out of it. I was doing all the protocol I need to. Yeah. Was consistent with it for a very long time. Like that wasn't just like a handful of times of sitting in front of the juve light, or a handful of times of being in the sauna, or a handful of fucking consistent days of supplements, or a handful of times of me going to the gym when I absolutely did not want to. I mean, that's been fucking eight months. Yeah of just st- sticking with it, sticking with it, sticking with it, and just now starting to feel good. Now, knowing that and knowing where, like for me, like it wasn't worth that. Like it, that feeling that I had to go through and mm-hmm. how hard that was, I would I would much rather have never had to have gone through that to, to than to have gone through it. Now, sure, it gives me, uh, I think, it would make me a better coach now, and I think I can speak from that side, and I think that's that adds value. Hopefully that adds value to people that listen to the show that can ask questions around that and I could share my honest opinion about it. But I definitely think that I I don't think I'd ever be at 200. My body type doesn't seem to want to be a 220, 230 type of guy. I've just, it's hard to separate all the factors, isn't it? Cause because you've been working out for so long too. Right. I mean, and I have people in my family Mm -hmm. who, who have worked with their hands for particular you know, jobs or whatever, like plumbers, mechanics, uh, you know, construction workers mm-hmm. who'd done it for decades and decades and never took steroids, ne- never even lifted weights, who are now retired and they're in their 70s and they don't work out or anything. But you look at like their forearms and the rest of them is atrophy because they're old and they don't do anything anymore, but they still have like these muscular forearms and hands yeah. from when they were, you know, for the last 50 years or whatever, they were working with them so much. So it's hard to separate all that. I would love to see a study, you know, that would be that could be done. That right, like maybe, happen. yeah, with the anabolics, it helped to like keep this this frequency, this this repeated like a uh, workout regimen that yeah. uh, you know, like for some people, like it really did keep them like hitting on those same uh, frequencies constantly. There's well, so yeah. many factors to consider because you also have your the receptors that anabolic hormones attach to. They downregulate when you have high levels of testosterone. So anybody who's ever used steroids will tell you 
that this they'll go on a dose. Let's say they go on 300 milligrams of testosterone, which is a relatively modest dose. They'll stop feeling it, and then they have to do- take more, and then they have to take more, and they have to take more, mm-hmm. or they'll go off, and then they'll go back on again, and they feel it again. Because like anything, your body tries to adapt and downregulates receptors. Mm-hmm. What if long-term exposure to high testosterone really downregulates the receptors to the point where they'll never come back to the way they were before? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's so many factors to consider. It's hard yeah. to say. Yeah. But I guess if all things were equal- That could be a massive negative, right? It, it could be. That's what I'm saying. And yeah. I know, I, look, I mean, we've been in this long enough. I know people who've- I know less people who were on it and went off of it who turned yeah. out like fit and healthy uh, see, afterwards. That's that's my like perspective too. Yeah. Is I've seen a lot of people like it ruined their body. Yeah, you know, like it, after they were done because like again they didn't know how to apply themselves and take the right proper measures to rebuild you know their their own body's uh, receptors. Well, I can tell just hormonally though, that stuff is not worth it. Like just what it's done hormonally. Yeah. I mean, as a young kid who wanted to look a certain way. I may have reached all those goals and that like that might have felt or filled that void but then what it did was it gave me a whole mess of other issues that I had to deal with mm-hmm. like everything from emotions to libido to energy to drive to do anything like and to me that isn't worth it like mm-hmm. so the the coolest looking physique I could have ever built is not worth all the hormonal imbalances cuz then you like the stuff that nobody talks about is that you know, if you're a if you're in a relationship, whether you're married or you're in a committed, serious relationship for a long time, and you're going through hormonal stuff at, at an age of thirty, you know what I'm saying? At thirty years old, dealing with stuff like that, that's no fucking fun, dude. People don't like going through menopause. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like, and that's like later in life, and people all expect it and anticipate it. You going through something hormonally like that when you're in your thirties. Man, that's a I thank God that I could articulate what I was going through so I to my partner and explain to her why I feel this way, what I'm going through, and and she has incredible patience. And man, if it wasn't for Katrina being somebody like that I, and not having an, a, a strong, stable partner during that time, who knows what yeah. a mess I could have mm-hmm. been too, you know? Yeah, so yeah. it's interesting. I mean, but would there be a potential benefit, like a benefit, I guess, for muscle size later on when you're off and everything's back to normal? I mean, I guess we could speculate that 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 might be the case, right. you know. Yeah, but the, I don't know if you memory may I, but, still be there. Yeah, but factoring in all the other potential factors, if if all things were equal, yes. But the fact that there's so many other factors that play into that, I think if we took a hundred men and had them do you know high doses of steroids for two years to to get, try and create that muscle memory, and compared them to a hundred men who never took steroids. But but also train and ate right and stuff like that, and then followed them for for ten years after. Mm-hmm. I would venture to say that the hundred guys that never took them would be better off. Yeah, that'd better, be more it. fit, more lean. Because I, I also ask because of all the other things. I know? always wonder too, though. Like, mm-hmm. so I you know I was I was stupid when I was a young kid. When I was mm-hmm. in my early twenties, the first time that I it wasn't until until I had to take it for therapy later on did I really understand it and really like start to run protocols correctly yeah. and stuff. Right. Otherwise. I wasn't doing a PCT right at all. You know, my my post cycle therapy uh, when I was a kid was stupid. It was didn't do anything really at all. You know, like I was not. I didn't see. I didn't know yet. You know, what I'm saying I, until it hit me, and then when it hit me, it was like, oh fuck! I really, I just fucked up my. You whole know, what trips good. me out. Back in the day, in the 70s, uh, I don't think they had. They didn't have the uh, the selective estrogen receptor uh, drugs like uh, Novadex or Clomid. Right. I don't think those were invented until the 80s. I don't think they had HCG back then, if I'm not mistaken. So there was no real protocol on the way. Well, out. Those no, guys, back then they would just go off. They would just yeah. go off. And well, and back then you would taper down, mm. and you weren't taking nowhere near what guys are taking now. No, oh, right. Yeah, you know now you're taking so many things that are are messing with your your hormones and your thyroid and everything else. Like there's so many. You're, I mean these pro bodybuilders now are a walking chemistry set Mm -hmm. and if you're some young kid who's thinking about getting involved in it like it's a scary thing to try and do like do i mean do not be fooled some of the besides the fact that most of these guys have the genetics to not only get massive like that but also the genetics to be able to handle all that testosterone that was something i noticed right away with my body too like my body was just reacting to it, I just couldn't handle much more than 500 milligrams. I get to right. 500 milligrams, and my mm-hmm. body would just fucking. What's well, the freak worst out. thing you can do for yourself, right? Is to go way too much. <laughs> well, I see it all the time. I yeah. see, I see guys that that you know. Well, are, because it becomes the answer to everything. That's yeah. why. So if it's not working, then more is going to work. More, more, yeah. more is going to work. More is going to work. But back in back, you know, a, not a while ago, 300 milligrams of testosterone a week was the pro dose. 
Mm-hmm. Today, that's the starting dose. Like if you're some kid and you go up to some you know de- <clears throat> roid de- steroid dealer at the gym and you say, hey, what should I start taking? The, a lot they'll of guys, recommend you take about 300. A guy's consider mm-hmm. that off cycle. That's like your, that's, your, <laughs> that's your off cycle. That's, off- not, that's not a replacement. That's way more than replacement. Wow. Yeah, it's way, way more uh-huh. than replacement. Uh-huh. But that's what a lot of guys consider. Like uh, this is off season, so I'm only running you know 300 milligrams a week yeah. of testosterone. No, I, I, the, 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 a, gram is, a gram is the competitive dose. They just take a whole gram of Damn. testosterone, which is like... What is that? Four cc's of a high dose. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're even a, take, it's a cc is two fifty normally in test your typical testosterone, unless you have something special. So yeah, about four cc. That's a yeah. lot. That's more than a full syringe worth yeah, of testosterone yeah, yeah, you're yeah. taking. They're just pushing it like crazy. Oy. This quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. First up is Diary of a Fit Guy. Do you think it's more important for advanced lifters to focus on minimum effective volume or maximum recoverable volume? Maximum recoverable volume and minimum effective, effective volume, volume are the same thing. Yeah. So what what I think I know what he's trying to communicate. He's trying to say, do I go with the least amount of work to give me the most results or do I go with the most amount of results that I recover can recover from? Mm. But the reality is that they're both the same thing. Yeah. Because the minimum volume, the a minimum volume would be something that causes your body to change a little bit. When we're talking about the minimum effective volume, what we're saying is do the least amount of work to give you the maximum benefit and then don't do more than that because then more than that is not only more than you need, but will take away from your body's ability to recover and adapt. And so that's the game. The game is, and, and, and that can be very, when you get a beginner, let me explain something. I learned this as a trainer, like two, three years into my training, you get a new client coming in who'd never worked out before. doesn't take much at all to get to hit that number. It doesn't take much at all. Like I would get a client and I'd be like, in early in the days, I'd be like, okay, today's your first workout. Well, then we'll just do three leg exercises instead of five. Three leg exercises, way too much for a beginner. And people would tell me that I couldn't walk for, you know, two or three days. Mm -hmm. So it was literally sometimes one set a full range of motion squats mm-hmm. will get somebody sore enough to where they can't oh, walk if for some, two days. If somebody has never squatted before and you put up 100 pounds, that's it, on their back, and they squat 10 reps, yeah, sore mm-hmm. for sure mm-hmm. for at least two or three days. You know what I'm saying? Like That's so foreign to that body, yeah. and there's no reason to push me on. Now, I think this is, whether you're an advanced lifter or you're a brand new lifter, I think this is the message is the same, and I think the, the message is the same for this reason. It's not because the advanced lifter can't technically handle more, but I think that we we have this culture around the the beast mode thing and get after it and like you have to earn these workouts and you got to push so hard. We have a very athletic or you know athlete mentality going into working out, and and working out isn't like that. Not to sculpt the physique. Like if you're training as an athlete, totally different. But if we're talking about and I and I know who we're talking to right now, mm. he's a competitor. So when you when you are training, you are more likely going to be the person who overdoes it. It's just I still to this day, this is the, our our message is always trying to tell people this, yeah. And I still catch myself flirting with the other side. Now, I think it's okay and healthy, especially for an advanced lifter like you, to do this because you can kind of flirt with that threshold. But I think a majority of people tend to push that and push it beyond too much to the point where it starts to hinder your results instead of actually accelerating like they think. Too many people connect the hard workout and the soreness with accelerating their results, and it couldn't be further from the truth. And I think a lot of times too, it's the, this is kind of playing in, like you love going to the gym. Like, you know, it's a, it's a culture, it's a, it's a ritual. It's, you know, a lot of times like it, it becomes this, 
this it becomes bigger than it needs to be. So like I'll stretch my workouts a little bit longer. I'll do a little bit more just because you kind of get into the rhythm, you get into the feel of it. But at the same time, like you, what you're creating is way more volume. Like where are you going to go from here as you've right. created all this volume? Now it's like consuming like <laughs> you know a huge portion of your day when right. it didn't need to. Yeah, there's a there's a uh, a right amount. I think that's the best answer. the The right amount is the one that's going to get your body to change the most and also it's also the right amount in the sense that it's not too much to where it prevents the adaptation pro- uh, uh, process from happening or prolongs the adaptation process. So what I mean by that is there's it's a perfect amount and the perfect amount is the minimum effective volume which also is the maximum amount that you can recover from uh, based on your goals. And I don't mean maximum recoverable in the sense that should I just push my body as hard as I possibly can so that I can just recover enough for my next workout. Well, no, because your goal is to progress. If you want your body to progress, you want to set the gears in motion for that to happen. And anything, anything you do that's over that takes away from your body's ability to uh, adapt and recover. Now, that doesn't mean you do nothing. What that means is because I can reduce my intensity. I can now facilitate recovery. I can facilitate better (laughs) recruitment patterns. I can focus on other things. But when it comes to setting those gears in motion... There's the you want to do the right amount. Any more than that, not only is it a waste of time, but it's only going to take away from your and from your ability to to change. And here's the thing: that amount is so different from person to person. The more advanced you are, the more that you need to do to make that happen. Like mm-hmm. if I take an advanced lifter, I take a, a high level athlete and I bring him in the gym. I have to train them at a certain intensity. Otherwise, I'm going to cause no adaptation. In fact, mm-hmm. if I train them like the average person, their body will actually lose. <clears throat> strength and lose endurance. I have to push them even harder. You know, they, they've done studies where they show, what do they, what do they call it? Uh, muscle protein synthesis. This is a, uh, one way you can measure whether or not muscles are, are building, right? And we see that that signal elevates uh, post-exercise or post-workout, and it stays elevated for anywhere between 24 to 72 hours, and then it starts to drop. This is why it's probably better to train your body more frequently with the same volume, the less frequently. So you can maintain that elevated protein synthesis signal. Now, here's the thing. The more advanced the trainer, the trainees are, the more advanced the lifters are, the shorter that stay, that the shorter period of time that that stays elevated. Where you could get somebody who's super, super advanced, that muscle protein th- synthesis level will spike and go down within 24 hours. In fact, I just read a study that was just published recently, and I shared it on the forum, where they took advanced lifters, so these are guys that have been working out for a long time, and they had half of them do both sides at the same total volume. Say everything was the same. The difference was this group over here did worked out their body three days a week. This group over here worked their whole body five days a week. That's a lot of frequency. Mm-hmm. They hit the entire body five days a week, but everything else was the same. The group that did it five days a week got more gains in strength and performance. <clears throat> Now, if I did that to the average person, way too much. Mm-hmm. But when you're really advanced, I mean, when I got to the point where I was training consistently. Well, the message I- behind what you're saying, too, right now, because if the volume is the same and you're splitting up over five versus three, like this is where like someone who's advanced like Sean, I think it'd be better off starting to implement more trigger sessions in your week. Big time. Than actually trying to push harder on the intensity side. Mm-hmm. I think competitors and athletes always gravitate towards the intensity side yeah, right. where you'd be far better off actually doing stuff that is, I mean, do a, I, and this is stuff that I'm doing right now. Like I'll, a day I'll come in and I know that my, my body's recovering in a, all over the place. And it's like, yet I want to stay consistent with coming to the gym. So the entire hour is all mobility work. What's great is my body is going to see gains from that still. People just don't think of it because I'm not pushing the body super hard. I'm going to, I'm going to promote more oxygen, more blood flow, more nutrients, faster recovery by doing so. And my body body's burning and train good recruitment patterns right when you were when you were competing at your high at the highest level and you were working on a weak body part how often and forget intensity i'm not talking about hard workouts but how often were you training the body parts you'd want to bring up throughout the week five days a week right yeah. right so i mean you were doing quite but i a bit. worked up to that yes so i mean that, I and that's what i'm saying your body at that point yeah. anything less than that and you probably would have seen right i think that's important to, to note that though is that you know something that i did from the day deciding that I'm going to lean out all the way to the day I was going to get on stage to I'm going to work my way always to the professional level was I was always 
building on building on the volume. And I and as I get to a show, like, and that's why I like this question too. I'm always leaning on the minimum effective dose because as I get closer to the show, I know I can start ramping that up. Like if I come out the gates and I'm crushing workouts, it's like okay, 12 weeks is my show. And I start coming out. I'm like hitting my workouts hard, and I'm trying to try and keep that that pace all the way through 12 weeks. It's not going to happen. Mm. I would way rather be on the other side and be like, okay, I'm going to do just what I think is enough, and then I get out of the workout and I go like, oh, I could have done a little bit more. That's okay. I got I got to work out tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So tomorrow I, I stretch myself a little bit, you know. So I'm always leaning on that, just doing what I need to do to elicit change, because I know that as I get into the final four or five weeks. I still got time, you know, and I still got like, okay, I haven't got, I haven't hit that extra level. I haven't hit that next level of training. I haven't increased my volume to, or come back for a second session. Like some of these guys do their entire, their entire prep. So you want to save that. So when you can, you can still control that. Otherwise, what I see a lot with competitors is the difference between their body, you know, 20 day, 15, 20 days out. And the day of the show is a little bit of a water pool. And that's about it. Other than that, they haven't made any real change aesthetically on because their body is plateaued so hard they're already pushing the most amount of volume they possibly can the only thing now they can manipulate is water and diet a little bit heading into the show you get diminishing returns you end up getting diminishing returns when you go past what you need to do to get your body to change think if you think about it in a point system like if 10 points equals maximum muscle building signal and you've sent you know the first set that you do may send you know give you five points the second set may give you another three points. The third set gives you another two points. Now each set successively may give you a quarter point or you know less. And so you get diminishing returns with each successive set. But in the meantime, you're taken away from your body's ability to recover and adapt because that also costs mm-hmm. points. And, and those don't diminish. In fact, they accelerate. So one set may cost two points of recovery. The second set costs an additional three. The third set costs an additional four. And if I keep pushing my body, yep. it's costing me more recovery time per the only muscle reason, building The only reason we recover, that keeps compiling and compiling, it. and it becomes even The only greater. reason why this is even a discussion is because of anabolics. Yeah. Because anabolics have allowed people to get away with this bullshit for a yeah. very long time. Because you can, if you took, if you take enough gear, you can just hammer the fuck out of your yeah. body, and yeah. it will just keep responding somewhat. So you get a right. lot. There's so much more room for error. If everybody was natural, and we were all trying to build these great physiques, this would be so crucial. And if they just train like they're natural, they would be doing so much better for their body. Right, and you know, so that, and that's where it's really tough to to argue with somebody who is running a bunch of gear and is just like these guys train like a bunch of pussies. Like I can go hammer, <laughs> yeah. And that that's really I, I remember Team No Sweat was the the nickname that Donnelly gave us way back when. And it's like, dude, just because you can train like a doesn't a, mean you should. Yeah, doesn't mean you necessarily should. Just because you can get away with that, to me, that's lazy. Yeah. To me, you're 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 not putting the. It's not the, mentally like the, the discipline there isn't right. as great as the opposite. This was to me. This was one of my biggest advantage of being an amateur coming into coming into it, knowing how to train and how to program. Was when I got into the space, not a, a lot of guys were hiring coaches. A lot of coaches were giving just kind of cookie cutter type of programs, and I really understood this piece and understood that I needed to give myself if I'm going to progress my body show after show after show, month after month after month and year after year, like I've got to give myself room and I do not want to come out. If you're the first six months of lifting, like your best workout of your life can't come then, you know what I'm saying? It's got to come down the road. Like I got to work up to my best workout of my life. And so I had that strategy going in so my body would continually to see progress and that's why we are always preaching the do as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change. I also think that... People, especially when you hate yourself and you feel like ah, I don't like the way I look or whatever, or I mm. eat a shitty diet. I also think that the the pain and the intensity and in, in the way they apply it's punishment. It's a punishment, and it and it it makes them feel like they're doing more. Like if I go to the gym, like if I want to lose thirty pounds, I'm really unhappy with my weight. Mm-hmm. And even if I know that you know forty five minutes of this workout is what I need, anything more than that is a little too much. I may still go in the gym and do more because I think I'm doing some more to get to my goal. Right. Like, fuck it, I'm going to th- do some extra credit. It doesn't work that way. If it did, then every workout would be literally as much as you can do, and that's how easy it would be. It yeah. would be so easy. Oh, you want to get that's fit? a lot of the advice that's given. Yeah. You yep. know, like, mm-hmm. dude, like every time you got to do more and more and more and more, and yeah. more is always better. Right. Mm-hmm. It's not the case. No, only with money. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Very true. Next question is from Double Lot Silk Drop. How do you prevent or minimize overtraining and under recovery if part of your profession includes exercising multiple times throughout the day? So this is, uh, you know, this is right. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So, so she does. She teaches uh, silks and stuff, and so she's constantly climbing these things. And you know, the the, the when you practice things on a regular basis. The body has an amazing. Yeah, it'll get adapted. It has an amazing capacity for workload. Amazing, and I know. Look, I've told this story a long time ago. I'm gonna tell it again. I remember when I was, I think I was like 15 or 16 years old. So maybe two years or three years of consistent weight training. You know, I thought I was pretty strong or whatever. And in the summertime, my dad would take me uh, to work with him. This particular sum- summer, my grandfather uh, from Sicily came to visit. And my grandfather at the time is, you know, let's see, I'm 60. He's like 67 or something like that at the time. And, you know, he's, he's, he's worked hard his entire life since he was a child. Grew up very, very poor. So he shows up and, you know, my dad's like, I got to go to work. And my grandfather's like, well, I ain't staying home. I'm coming to work with you. So my dad had, you know, no choice but to bring him. So he brought his 60-something-year-old, you know, old Sicilian dad with him. And so my job as a kid was, you know, my dad was a, a – he did the marble and the tile and the – granite work, all the stuff that needed skill and measurements and all that stuff. And he'd float the floors and do all that stuff. My job was the grunt work. Like I grab the, the cement, I mix the cement with the sand. I bring in the buckets, I bring the empty buckets out, I refill them. And that was basically my job, right? Cause I didn't have all the skills. So one of the things I had to do was mix cement. And if you've ever mixed mud before, by hand, it's a big tub. It's a huge, huge tub. Top three worst jobs I've ever uh, had. Yeah. It's a huge tub. You throw in sand, then you throw in the cement, and then you add water, and then you mix it with like a with hoe. Big ass shovel. With like it uh, looks like a hoe, right? I do. And you shovel. you mix one side, and then you go to the other side. You mix the other side, and you right. go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Mud is heavy. It's dense. It's a it's a very laborious, exhaustive job. So so good for all kids to do oh, this. Oh, job. I used to do it. Every in teenage barrel. boy should have to all do this all the time in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> I used to pour it in. Make... Builds fucking character. Oh, dude. and shit, dude. Yeah. So it's hot as fuck outside. It was summertime, obviously, because I'm out of school. I'm here. I am. I, my poor old grandfather, who looks old. He looks older than his age because again, he's been working since he was probably five, right? <laughs> so here he is, and he's like, "Oh, I'm gonna help you mix cement." So I'm like, okay. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to make sure he's okay doing this because he looks like an old man or whatever. So he stands on one side of the, the tub. I stand on the other side of the tub. I start mixing. And when I'm done, I, I tip it over to him, the hoe over to him. And then it's his side, his turn. And so we go back and forth. This son of a bitch, man, was going and going and going and going. And it got to the point where now I'm like, I am not stopping. Hell no, I'm not stopping. He's 60-something-year-old old man. No way in hell I'm gonna let this guy like outwork me. So we're going back and forth. There's a there's a freaking cooler of water <laughs> that's like in the shade, like 12 feet away, and I'm watching it. But we're still mixing. We're carrying buckets of cement. We're mixing, and he kicked my ass that day. He absolutely kicked my ass. And the reason why he kicked my ass is that guy has been doing shit like that since he was a child, nonstop. His body has acclimated and adapted to this incredible work volume, and your body will do this too with what you're doing. I think the key is to not is to manage the intensity of, of why you're doing this. Like if you mm-hmm. max your body out every time you you do these activities, because that'll move as your capacity goes up, the ability to max yourself up will come, will, will come up. And if you keep pushing your body, then you're going to overtrain. But if you manage your intensity and you do this over a long period of time, whew, you could build incredible workload, like incredible. Have you guys, you guys have worked with, with construction workers? Yeah, seen? of oh, course. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just the grip strength alone, uh, you know, with most most construction workers I've worked with is, is unreal. But yeah, like you said, it's 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 a matter of like, and they find different ways and techniques doing the same job every time to make it more efficient. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing I took away from when I was doing construction was it's a skill how a effective and efficient and, and timely that they could finish projects versus me sloppily like putting my strategy <laughs> together and fucking you know like like sawing through shit and like starting over again and you know like the very like methodical and the thing about experience is it brings those things out like so that that efficiency so yeah finding that way to to more effectively go through those movements and like bring down your, your intensity body gets efficient a little bit them. yeah it makes a lot now, of sense now would you guys say that building this work capacity though is hinders your ability to change your body composition hmm. 
I think it contributes. I think it actually benefit you. Oh, you I, think it benefits? Oh, you? yeah, for oh, that's sure. Interesting. I think it. I think it. I think it could make it more challenging. Oh, I think you take somebody. If you take somebody, and you train them properly, and they have good diet, but then on top of that, they're they're adapted to this incredible workload where they they work with their hands and they're they're active. You're dealing with somebody who's who could, who at some will be able to handle more in the gym recover better and feel better. The problem I see with oh, a lot see, of- I disagree. I disagree. I think somebody that's built a lot of work capacity, and, and we could use silks, we could use a football player, we could use uh, a mailman who walks around all day long for his job. I think what happens is they, they become so adapted uh, for moving so much that when and for the amount of calories they're probably consuming that when you try to change body composition by maybe adding resistance training and doing this, sure, the body might see some sort of change at the beginning because it's a new adaptation, but because they're, they're, their bodies have adapted to such a high work capacity that it's harder to manipulate their body composition in comparison to somebody who is like completely green, well, fresh. Well, you're not going to throw a bunch of cardio on them. No, you know you're not no, going to say have hey, to be a totally different stimulus. Yeah, for you, their body you, to react. Yeah. You have to be smart with the diet and the training. I'm not going to take somebody who works eight hours a day with their hands and and wants to lose weight. I'm going to do some weights with them like I normally would, <clears throat> and I'm going to watch their diet. But I'm not going to say go do another thirty minutes of cardio because that's stupid. You're already moving, you know, eight hours a day. But no, man. I mean, let me tell you something. I, I've been around. <laughs> I've been around these Russian judo players who have a work capacity that makes you think that they're not human. Literally, they would come in and train for two or three hours, you know, judo, jujitsu. Then they'd go lift weights and then they come back and do it again. And nobody's sore, everybody's fresh, but they've been training like that since they were, you know, five years old. The capacity that you can build on your body is just insane. You just have to manage intensity. And here's the other thing, too, that I think is extremely important for people who are active throughout the day is if you need to learn anything, it's learn how to prevent muscle imbalances and learn how to, to work on mobility and prevent overuse injuries. Because whatever the activity is that you do a lot of, it's probably the same type of activity throughout the day. So if you're climbing a lot, you're doing a lot of overhead pulling, okay? So you're probably going to have imbalances in your shoulders and your scapula you probably need to work on stuff with your wrist and your hands from all the gripping. So we need to work on mobility there, maybe some myofascial release to loosen some stuff up. Um, if you're, you know, depends on what your job is, right? Those repetitive movements ca- create these patterns yeah. that can, I think if you know how to offset those, I think you're going to do <clears throat> Yeah, because you way see better. a lot of repetitive exercise injury. Yes. Right? It'd be yeah. interesting for me to see what she's kind of burning on a daily basis uh, like calorie wise, like for all the workload that she's doing and how much she's consuming too. Because the first, the first thing that comes to mind when I when I think of a question like this and I try and picture this person and and maybe some of the challenges they have reminds me of like when I used to teach uh, like Group X instructors. So I trained a lot of um, aerobics yeah, instructors. Yeah, they burn a lot. Yeah, and they teach four or five classes in a day. And that yet they'd be overweight and they'd be like, Adam, I don't get it. Like Mm. I I teach these classes, I'm sweating my ass off for three, four hours a day and I lift weights and I eat pretty good. I don't understand why Mm. I can't change my body. And because their body has been adapted to this such a high level of work capacity and they were eating such low of calories Mm. that, you know, for me to add some resistance training or maybe to adjust their calories by four or 500 calories, it just wasn't enough for their body. They had they had created such a a discrepancy between the two that they needed to really reset everything. They actually needed to like if I really wanted to help these people out, we had to slowly reverse diet them for a very long time in mm-hmm. introducing more calories or I had to convince them to teach less classes or take it easy in these classes. So you know why that's a little different? So and I, I've worked the same exact. I know exactly mm-hmm. what you're talking about. I've had the same exact clients. The difference is when you're uh when you're when you're a construction worker or when you're you know, something that requires lots of movement with, you know, labor or whatever. They're not doing it for a workout. They're not doing it to try and be high energy and burn more calories. What they're literally doing- They're trying to be efficient. You're trying to be efficient. Yeah. If you ever watch a really, really seasoned, you know, construction worker or, you know, tile setter or plumber or whatever, the way they move and stuff is, they're not there to try and sweat and stuff. When you're teaching classes- Yeah. A lot of those aerobics instructors are doing the class with the with the class, and they're trying to like push themselves, especially when they want to lose weight. I've had spin instructors tell me like, "Oh, I do three spin classes a day," and I'm like, "What mm-hmm. do you mean you do three? Oh, I teach them. 
I'm like, are you teaching them or are you doing them? Well, no, I'm doing them too because I want to burn calories. And you know that they're pushing their body right. mm -hmm. the entire time. They're not monitoring or you know that that intensity. <laughs> I think you have to you watch your intensity. If you're yeah. doing that much activity, you well, can't be going hard. That's why. And even if you're not going, like, because no, no matter how you draw it up, like climbing up on silks is hard. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, sure. so maybe it's not hard for her because she's been doing it her whole life or everything. But I would really like to see how much what her output looks like. Her output could potentially be so high, and I know I know her, well, so you, I know I'm she, sure her body stopped burning tons of calories doing it by this point, right? right. Mm -hmm. So that's so you know I don't know I have I have different theories on this than I think you guys do. I I just feel like and, and it really depends on what her goal is because if you're just trying to prevent overtraining under recovery, if that has nothing to do with body composition, then my points matter nothing. Mm. Like what I'm bringing to the table has to do with changing your body composition, not really to do with recovering and building more muscle. Now, I think building a lot of muscle, I think you may be right in that mm. case because your body's still trying to stay efficient yeah. for mm -hmm. that job, right? Right. So I could see how that would, it may be hard to build tons and tons of muscle. For sure. You know, I, I could see that for sure because your, your body's trying to stay efficient at this thing that you do all day long and lots of muscle is not and also, efficient. And also burn a lot of fat, right? Mm -hmm. If she's if she's got her body adapted to a moderate 1,300 to 1,800 calorie range and yet she's moving all day long, climbing silks, that body should be burning 2,500, right. 3,000 calories minimum a day. Right, I mean, well, it just I, makes me think of you know like Fedor, you know, like like just his body uh, yeah, yeah. physique, you know, but like he's like so fucking conditioned and 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 powerful and explosive and everything, but you you'd never guess based on looking at his body, but it's just like he's so well adapted to this this crazy like demand yeah. that um, you know it's it is like a, a you know a, a composition thing mm -hmm. would would be challenging. Next up is Mikey's life. If someone is in poor health mentally and physically, which should be addressed first Ooh, wow. and why? Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, man, that is, you know, that's a hard one. Yeah, it is hard. And you could, I could debate it either way. I really could. Mm. I, I mean, I could, I'm going mental. That's my, it seems obvious yeah, but, to do that. But yeah. a lot of times the roadblock that's causing people to is not moving. Yeah. Yeah. Is the physical not only the not moving piece, like positive feedback, also yeah. what they're looking at every single day in the mirror is also ca causing them to be depressed and moving in the right direction physically could potentially start to change their their mindset. So, yeah, God, that's a you know yeah. I think here's the thing I don't think you can separate the two. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you I know agree. that I agree with. For yeah, sure. I mean the the human the human organism is is one organism, and we 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 do this we separate it out because mm -hmm. we want to learn about each particular area and function and, and it's a great way to learn deep deep knowledge about specific things but then we also get create this illusion that they're all separate like there's mm -hmm. a physical and a mental aspect you can't you can't really separate the two now they both bleed into each other yeah and now wh what do you mean by you know do you just focus on mentally before physically or vice versa does that mean that before we work out we go to therapy right. and we talk about what we're trying to do Versus we 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 physically or you move self assess like you know like you try and you know identify like where this is coming from yeah like, if the if the options are do we go to therapy first before we go work out or do we work out first before we do therapy then I'm going to make the argument that the physical activity should be first and here's why it's clean cut it's clear it's black and white hmm. and it's basic and it's, it's easy. something you can do right away where I, I I could take somebody who's got like a bad body image, like really, really poor, you know, self-image, body image issues or whatever. And I could make, have them move the right way and train them and it opens them up for the mental aspect a little easier. Whereas the other way around might be a little bit more challenging to work with. I've mm -hmm. seen a lot of mental change through physical change, mm -hmm. a lot. And mm -hmm. it never happens. One never happens without the other. Yeah. You know, so... That's a, it's a very very tough question, but they're not they're not separate, you know. Mm -hmm. Changing your body changes your mind as well. Remember, your mind connects to your body. That's the that's what gives you the feedback from the world, the how you're moving, what you're doing when you're moving. Of course, the way you view yourself that's a mental thing, but it's also a physical thing. Uh, look at pain. Look how we manage pain. Try and try and separate the physical sensation of pain from your 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 feelings about the pain. Well, like, good luck. It much harder to break that positive feedback loop like mentally versus you know if it's it's attached to like movement in your body and do like it just seems to me that like interrupting that process by just moving and doing things differently will help to kind of break you out of that yeah you know cycle uh, here's an example let's say you have a friend that's depressed like oh my god dude i'm so depressed right now uh you know very something very difficult happened and, and you're you're trying to talk to them but it's hard for them to open up it's easy for me to be like let's go on a walk you don't have to talk let's just go on right. a walk 
And then we do the physical aspect. You know what ends up happening typically from the physical piece? The it men- opens you up. The mental start yeah. starts to come out. The emotional yeah. stuff starts to come up. So right. I've noticed that too with clients. Yeah, they're a lot more receptive to talking about you know their life and like what's going on in their life when you bring them outside of like a, a an environment where it's confined. You know, you let them just like move and and yeah, like it just naturally kind of comes out. They just did a study uh, at a Texas a Texas school. <laughs> where they were trying to solve the ADHD and ADD problem. I posted it in the forum um, at the school because so many kids were being prescribed these drugs. And so you know what the school did? Hmm. They tripled recess. Oh, wow. So instead of recess being one 20-minute thing, they did three 20-minute recesses. And wow. you, you know what the results were? Oh, that'd be awesome. Far better Way than better. far better than the I medication. It. Oh Fuck yeah! Oh, they they basically say that they cured ADD and ADHD Dude, that's in their amazing. school from tripling the activity level. And of yeah, their what's kids. the first thing to 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 get cut out? You know, like any any sort of physical activity or like uh, extracurricular activities. Well, that, didn't that we read? It? Didn't you? Didn't you read a study a long time ago on the show that just talked about like they had done where they had had kids where like every hour they gave them like a five or ten minute exercise yeah. and then they. Did something like that. So, yeah, uh, Dr. Ed Thomas, um, which I still really want to get on the show. He's hard to get uh, a hold of, but um, he's out in Iowa. They implemented um, these these short breaks where they would take, you know, with like very specific exercises that help to get you into extension, that get you in those certain poses where you create better postural um, supporting type movements and and their academic the academic side of it actually went up substantially so they're performing they're outperforming like any of the surrounding states because mm-hmm. they just started to do this one simple thing well it's like that video that uh, documentary we were watching was it magic pills we were watching it and yeah. the one lady who says like they wanted their hit her son to go on it and she's like absolutely not I just took his ass to the park and ran him for fucking three hours yeah. every night yeah. you know what I'm saying yeah. it was just fine yep yep yeah yeah right you know what I'm saying he yep, just, yep. just work his ass out a little bit yeah I think <laughs> I, I think I mean you, you you can't you can't disconnect the two I guess I also think we look at our our physical state it's so it's so weird the way we we uh evaluate ourselves or feel sorry for ourselves or hate on ourselves when we look at the the mirror is just a, a reflection of how you've been taking care of yourself mm-hmm. that's all it is just feedback just another feedback mechanism i look at myself and i see where i'm currently at right now and it's not oh poor me this happened and oh this show's shitty for me this happened it's just like well you know yeah. this, this is this is the pri- i've made it that i have all these other things in my life i've got my my partner and I've got work and I've got school and I've got family and I've got all these things that I've just made a higher priority than I've made taking care of my health and myself. It's that yeah. fucking simple. And I'm staring at the mirror across, across from me and it's reflecting that. Well, and you see, like, like you said in the beginning, like it's intertwined because like, you know, when you smile more, like how that affects you emotionally. And vice versa, when you have slouched posture and you're let, you don't give any eye contact with people, like what that tends to do it you know it perpetuates this this feeling inside you that you know you feel depressed it's all feedback so when you're in certain positions or certain facial expressions uh or breathing patterns your brain perceives it as stress or happiness or calmness and so then it feeds it it feeds it into and it starts to activate other systems in the body hormones and chemicals that prepare you for you know what you this particular feedback that you're giving it so it's this feedback loop and it's it starts. It can start in the mind, but it can start in the physical. This is, by the way, this is a fact. So they did, the, they did a study on, on women who got Botox to get rid of their frown uh, wrinkles. Yeah, uh, yeah, I remember this. And their rates of depression dropped mm-hmm. because they couldn't frown as much. Now mm-hmm. they also lost empathy points. So they also tested them on empathy, mm-hmm. and they lost some of that because you need to be able to feel things yourself in order to empathize with people. Right. But and you they did another one where, where they'd have people. Put up, and they didn't even tell people to smile because some some scientists said, oh, maybe some of these studies that show when people try to smile, it makes them happy. It's because they know they're trying to smile. So they're like, how can we get people to smile without telling them smile? So they said, okay, hold a pencil in between your teeth. So they had to kind of hold it like this and it forces you to smile. And then they still tested them. And sure enough, people felt happier and felt. Yeah. So there's that feedback. <laughs> it's crazy, that, man. Yeah, it's crazy. There's, that, there's all that feedback. You can't separate the two. It's all no. the same. Next one is from DFMMA Law. Will missing breakfast affect your progress if you're trying to gain muscle, or is it just your total food intake for the entire day that matters? 
it's largely, I'd say, the vast majority, like 98%, the your total food intake yeah. for the entire day that matters. Now, that 1% or 2% that we're talking about, we could look at studies that show that you know, maximizing protein synthesis, if you eat every maybe six hours, is probably ideal. And if you skip a meal too consistently, your cortisol may be a little elevated and all these other things. Splitting hairs. But yeah, you're, you're splitting hairs. Splitting hairs. At the end of the day, like where this becomes important, like, and this is interesting that we're doing this question right now too, because one of the meals that I wasn't eating was breakfast during this whole time. So I was skipping breakfast till one or two o'clock in the afternoon. It was my first meal. And that's completely changed. So now every morning I just get up. And a lot of that is just because because of my day. In order to hit the caloric intake that I need to hit, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm trying to gain right now. I'm putting emphasis on increasing my carbohydrates. I I just need to get that meal in in order to hit that calorie intake. Now, if I didn't, could I put all my calories towards the end of the night and be just fine? Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with that. But where I find uh, this is an issue for people is if you have, again, kind of like this ectomorph type of body type and you struggle with putting size on, it's less of that you struggle with the putting the size on. It's that you probably are not getting adequate calories every single day in order to promote growth. And so that person, I would say, yeah, maybe get your breakfast. But as far as the whole breakfast thing and having to get that mm-hmm. and what Sal was talking about, you're talking about splitting hairs is a difference. For yeah. Sure. You know who yeah. pushes the whole like breakfast is the most important meal of the day? Cereal the bre- yeah, the breakfast food industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's a reason why you know breakfast, lunch, and dinner have particular like, foods. Post uh, and General Mills. Yeah, I yeah. mean to create that ritual of breakfast. That ritual is uh, there's a lot of people that profit from that, and it's funny because when I, I remember when we were kids, remember the commercials. Yeah. For, Two scoops, Kellogg's yeah. brand. Yeah, I remember they would show Two cereal coming back again. Do you remember at the end of every cereal commercial, what would it say? As part of a part ba- balanced breakfast, and what would it bre- what would it yeah. show the breakfast to be? Yeah. A glass like of orange, orange juice, juice. Like all sugar. It was always yeah. a glass of orange yeah. juice, yeah. Yeah. a bowl of cereal, and some toast, a slice of toast. <laughs> a slice of toast. <laughs> Who the fuck came up with this? <laughs> all carb, 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 carb. Who the fuck came up with and this? Sugar. This was the and that, and non-fat milk. And how many how many kids from like 1980 to fucking 2000 were probably oh, eating just conditioned exactly us that? Like yeah. Bro, crazy. how many parents? How many, yeah, how many parents fed their kids some toast, some cereal, and some orange juice to every start their day? Single morning, <laughs> non-fat so, milk. So easy. Yeah. Then we wonder why diabetes. Yeah. Fucking oh my god. Oh, you want, you're hungry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just throw it in a bowl. Let's start your fucking... start your day off with some yeah. insulin resistance. Yeah. Literally, I don't care what brand of cereal it was. I'm gonna pull up some old ass commercials. You know it's funny. <laughs> and at the end, it was the same breakfast: yeah. bowl of cereal, non-fat milk. It would say on and it. And he had some crazy cracked out cartoon character. Yeah. It would like, literally yeah. say. It would say on the carton: non-fat milk. Every commercial was the same: bowl of cereal. One or two slices of toast, I can't remember, and a glass of orange juice, and you knew it was orange juice because it would always be an orange right next to the orange yeah. juice every single time. You know, I think they've even changed that now. They don't even say balanced breakfast; they say like it's part of a part of your uh, your breakfast, like part of the start of the day, or, or like something like they, they. It's not even like part of balancing anything. It's just like it's a breakfast. Yeah, you Here know, it is. You know, something's fucked up when the FDA would consider you know frosted flakes healthier than uh, avocado. <laughs> Because an avocado's got wow. so much fat in it, you oh know. Versus, God. I just want—I wanted to that's, put in here what, that's what ridiculous. two pieces of toast, a bowl of a bowl of cereal with and, non-fat milk, yeah, bowl of cereal. yeah, yeah. Like we're gonna go the, of orange juice, right? Right. We'll go non-fat or low. What do you think? People, it was always non-fat. Yeah, yeah. Non, yeah. the commercial yeah. always had fat was which, the devil. by the way, is more sugar in it, right? So yeah, so, it's just uh, pure lactose. It's just sugar and 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 some protein. Yeah. <laughs> you guys ready yeah, for this? Yeah. yeah. Are you ready? Macros. Okay. So I put four cups because that's probably what the size of the bowl that I would have. Most people don't. By the way, if you've never done this before, everybody should do this at least one time. Your standard like small bowl that oh my god yeah that you have of cereal is normally like anywhere between three to four cups worth of cereal. So if you've never done that before, measure your cereal sometimes. Is that what they're saying is the standard size? Like when they're on the box, like you know the oh standard the standard serving. The standard serving is nowhere near what like you two cups right oh. or something. Dude, this is a hundred and ninety grams of carbohydrates. That's oh. that's as much as I eat all day. Look, <laughs> look, 80, look at, 88 grams of sugar. Yes. Look at the picture. 88 that's, grams of sugar. That's exactly what I put in look there. Look at the picture. Oh, that's exactly oh, what I put oh, in Oh, I'm sorry. I messed up. Okay, here it is. Bowl of cereal with some berries in it. That's right. They always throw oh, berries, berries in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That so looks Get your yeah. antioxidants. Yeah. Oh, then there's two slices of toast with a pat Fruit. of margarine. It was not butter. It was margarine because bar- butter's too high in cholesterol and fat. <clears throat> then there'll be another glass of milk and a glass of orange juice. Who do you think is working together together? 
yeah. for this commercial. I mean, you better be working in a coal mine. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you think's working together? You have the grain industry, like wheat and corn and soy. Then you have milk. <laughs> and the dairy. <laughs> and yeah, and they're all working together to create this. Look at every single one. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Total. That, isn't yeah. that crazy? Yeah. It is. Special yeah. K. Remember Special K? They had to try and like get lean. Yeah. Like and the, the irony when I when I start helping somebody out and I actually assess their diet and I look at their sh- sugar is one of the first places I look to eliminate, right? And yeah. most people, look at that Dunk. I didn't even know Dunkin' O's was a thing. That's how. <laughs> Dunkin' O's? Like, <laughs> Tim Dunkin' Tim is Duncan his, own, for his own cereal. Wow. Oh, oh, it's speaking, so speaking of basketball, didn't, what's the name go to the oh, Lakers? Oh, yes, dude. How did we not Holy bring that up? Shit. I'm surprised you fuckers didn't bring it up. Oh, I yeah. was waiting we got for you to bring it into up. your article. You know what's funny? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Fuck. We went in the science direction. How crazy oh, is that? God. LeBron James going over to the I Lakers. Called it, bro. I called him, No, you, you did. Yeah, you could, I knew. Because he made a mistake. Yeah. I was like, how funny is that? That sound because said, oh, is he, does he play for the Lakers? The La- oh. Well, I was, I was just, I was predicting. You're from the future. Yeah, I yeah. know. South Stradamus. <laughs> I know. Again. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, breakfast is not, it's not that important. You could totally skip. Here's a, here's what's important. If you, what under, the hell if, is that? If you start to, if you understand how to read your body and listen to your body, uh, do what makes you feel best. Because if eating breakfast in the morning makes you feel like shit and sluggish and all that stuff, uh, skipping it will probably benefit your gains. Is the cereal industry still growing, shrinking, staying the same? What is it? What's it doing? I don't know. Doug, look that question. up. Yeah. It's got to be shrinking. I well, again, feel, I, this is us in our I little know. bubble. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think when you think of yourself, like I- You I know was, who loved cereal? All I know is Lucky Charms has got that. Dude, I ate cereal into my mid 20s for sure. Bro, bro, parents love cereal because yeah. before cereal, you parents make, used to cook to make, breakfast. You had to make, yeah, moms had to make eggs. Used you know? to have, yeah. you made, you had to cook breakfast. Like, yeah, it's fucking hard. And then they're like, give ah, them, just give them all this like shit. Yeah. Cereal with, with, is a like, fifty-four billion dollar in industry. Is by twenty twenty-five? Is it going up or down? That's what I want to know. Yeah. Oh, it's. It's going up. But it depends what's in there. I wonder if- What do you mean? What well, you mean? It, what what cereals are growing is what I like to see, not just breakfast cereal. Like, what if it's right. like- Oh, well, I think- that Macadamia I, nuts, you know? Put it, <laughs> no. What's, you know, what's, what's <laughs> hot now is like still staying in the cer- cereal space is now everyone's trying to make the, the healthy looking cereal. You know what I'm saying? Make yeah. it like, oh, this is lower sugar or this is more fiber. So, or so, ba- is- so back in the 80s and 90s, what was considered healthy was super high fiber- High carbs, super super low fat, uh, low uh, fat, fat. Yeah. and and then some of them were like, oh, we're gonna try and go low sugar too. So what you would get would be basically flakes of bran, or <laughs> yeah, and like, it was. I want to know who was eating those big ass like shredded wheat without sugar, without the frosting on it. It was yeah, just a without any ass, of it, yeah. just a big ass fucking frosted mini wheat like, is one of my favorites. Uh, no, 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 not I, frosted. These I were tried just the one time. I felt yeah. I literally felt like like a cow. Or like, yeah. like, like a horse or something. It like, gives so much. Am I eating hay? It gives you so much bulk to your stool that you will take a mammoth nine pound shit because. <laughs> You know what I mean? Because it's all fiber. Yeah. yeah you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. You're just like, oh. Uh, just cleans, the, cleans you right out. I remember when I was a kid, I'd watch the commercial like with- a big, like, broom. What was that cereal? They looked like little pellets, and they were like little brand pellets. Uh, nutri- corn nutri- nutri- nuts? Oh, no. no, grape nuts. Grape, grape nuts. nuts. Yes. yes. I thought grape nuts. Grape look nuts. up grape nuts, Doug, for me. I want to see what it looks like. So yeah. high calorie. Bro, my grandpa used to have those and like put it in the microwave and eat it. Bro, like, I, used, I used to think it was- I watched the commercial. I'm like, that looks good. I begged my mom, buy me grape nuts. I didn't know that it was a flavorless- <laughs> no fucking just fiber bomb. Yes, it's terrible. And like I, you're eating BBs. It's, dude, it's it's like rabbit food. Dude, I ate a I ate a a a there it is. bowl of it, and I remember I couldn't breathe because my stomach was so. <laughs> I couldn't breathe. Dude, you know how dense it is. Uh, you know how dense. I used like to a, use I used to use it to bulk because it's just so dense. Oh yeah, you, uh, you I mean you want to see calories ramp up real quick? Pour a bottle or a bowl of fucking grape nuts because. They are so dense. You pour in, you fill up one full bowl. That's like four cups worth of that shit. Four cups of that stuff. You're talking about a thousand calorie bowl of cereal. What Damn, is, dude. Now, what is grape nuts made with? It's just whole grain wheat flour, mal- malted barley flour, isolated soy protein, salt, whole grain barley yeah, flour. Just packed with inflammation. Malt, malt extract yeah. and dried yeast. Here you go, Adam Psoriasis. This is yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is a gluten bomb. Yeah, it is a gluten bomb. This is a gluten oh, atom bomb. Half a cup of grape nuts is 150 calories, 19 grams. You know what sold me? Holy Nine shit. grams of protein on it. That's yeah, what sold me. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Nine grams. What? You mean I can have cereal and pick up some protein? protein? Oh, oh man. Yeah. Here was my sold. Here was my bulk. My 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 standard bulk was well. I went whole milk. You went whole milk too, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Think. At least you did that, right? Yeah. I would <laughs> do. Right. I would do a punch bowl with Cheerios just because I could eat a lot of them. So I'd do a punch bowl of Cheerios. Mm-hmm. I would do between 10 to 12 
scrambled eggs Cheerios. on Ugh. top of it. Oh yeah. my god! And then and then I throw down some more milk on top of it, and wow. now I can't have wow. most of those foods. Yeah, yeah. You know what I had? Speaking of dairy, I had well, it's not dairy; it's non-dairy. So somebody who like loves ice cream like I do, I found Whole Foods. They have an almond milk ice cream. Oh, I've had it. So good. Yeah, you've had it? Almond yeah, milk really ice cream. Dude, I was, you know. They have almond milk and then coconut, of course, coconut milk ice cream. Yeah, I've yeah. had that. Before. It was uh, 365 is the brand. Yeah, it's mm. really good. Yeah, 365. It's at Whole Foods. And it, I had uh, almond milk, mint chocolate chip, non dairy frozen dessert. Mm -hmm. The whole thing. Not like, a lot of sugar in there, though, yeah? No. Really? No, not bad at all. Wow. Yeah, no, no, not at all. For not for, uh, let's see here. I, put, I thought I put it in here. I could tell you the exact if I put it in my fat secret. Mm. I thought I did. But it's, uh, I mean, comparison, right? For yeah, well, you're gonna compare it to like Ben and Jerry's. <clears throat> yeah, so like that that size of a Ben and Jerry's is a 1600 calorie, you know, pint or mm -hmm. whatever of of ice cream. I'll tell it's you, only, what, that was only 600. What blew me away that you introduced me to was the cocoa whip. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I've what used the? That. You know why it blows me away? Because it's nothing. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing in it. I literally, that's, that is, if I'm gonna have a it's dessert, like 50 that's what calories. I have. Me and Corey have like strawberries, blueberries, and, yep. and that. That's it. Bro, you I, eat I a big old bunch of it so at 50 sweet, calories. Dude, holy shit. I There's nothing to, in it. I have that to a science, dude. Literally, yeah. for Peter, you go here. We haven't done a little cool recipe giveaway for people to tell, tell you guys to do this. So you take the cocoa whip that Sal's talking about, which you can get at like uh, Sprouts or your- Whole Foods. Does or, Whole Foods have them? Whole yep, Foods has yep, it? Okay, yep. so Whole Foods has it. A couple of your- Even Knob Hill has it, or Rayleigh's, I guess. Knob Hill yeah. does have it, yeah. yeah. So it's, you know, I, I take a, a cup to two cups of the cocoa whip. I put a quarter cup of blueberries- Four or five sliced up strawberries, sprinkle flaxseed over it, and drizzle like a like a teaspoon of honey mm -hmm. over the top of that thing. Ooh, it's Drizzle. so good, dude! Look at this. Bomb. Look at this. Two tablespoons. Okay, so two tablespoons, thirty calories. Yeah, it's nothing. Yeah, it's you, like it's made can, out of. You air. can literally eat the whole thing, and you're only going to consume like four hundred something calories. Are you sure it. about that? Yeah, yeah. It's twenty two <laughs> servings in the container. Yeah, so twenty two. What's twenty two times thirty? Do, do, Six hundred something. Wow, really? Yeah, 600. 660. Yeah, for the wow. whole thing. You're not going to eat that whole thing either. I think the most I've ever had is- Challenge accepted. I've, I've ate half of it. Half of it's a big serving. It's it like is. A, it's a big serving. Yeah, if you want a huge serving, you eat half of that, but 300- so, so you know what I did? What? Is I took Cocoa Whip, and I took a bunch of it, and I put it in a bowl, and then I sprinkled uh, the chocolate-flavored um, uh, Organifi protein, and I mix it in, mix it in, mix it in. Takes a while. Wow. And it becomes a little bit more liquid. Then you throw it back in the freezer, let it go hard. Now you have a high protein cocoa whip dessert. You basically made like your own ice cream. I did. You've yeah. been holding out on that organic. I did. I did. Recipe for it's me. it's well it's simple. I, I'm embarrassed yeah. sometimes to introduce my recipes because no, it's those like are good. <laughs> Hey guys, you know what I like to do? I mean that would have been I like a good to put protein well, powder in oatmeal, easy. you know. That would have yeah, been a good organic right. commercial. Nobody's ever right done it. Well, I just yeah. did it. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> At the end. There there it is. <laughs> hey, check this out. If you go to mindpumpfree.com, we have a bunch of free guides on there. 12, I believe. I believe there's 12 guides on there. How to build your legs, how to build your calves, how to build your chest, how to get a flat tummy, uh, how to do high-intensity interval training properly. They're awesome and they're free. Mindpumpfree.com. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.